I'm Borislav, and I come from Bulgaria, which is way over there. Uh, some of you, has anyone heard of Bulgaria? <laughs> yeah, of course, you've probably been there to the seaside, I know. Um, so I'm uh, mostly a C++ programmer. I dabble in other languages too. And I'm mostly a game programmer since 2006 at least. And I initially worked on desktop PC games, then I moved to mobile games, and that's where I am now, at a company called Chobo Labs. I also like open source. Uh, I like the culture, the, the whole kind of idea of open source software, so I uh, help a lot with different open source projects. I have some of my own. And the topic of today's talk is dynamics, a new take on polymorphism. So that's kind of a mouthful, so let's just go ahead and analyze the title a bit, starting from the back. So first of all, what is polymorphism? Uh, most of you are probably like familiar with the, the concept, so I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, it basically means, well, it literally means many forms. In, uh, in the context of programming, polymorphism means that the same piece of code can be used to do multiple different things. Polymorphism comes in two varieties. One of them is static polymorphism, where um, in C++, static polymorphism is well, created by, for example, function overloads and, of course, templates. And basically, that means that the compiler is the, the one responsible for handling the different uh, executions of the, of the same piece of code. So the compiler generates different binaries for the same piece of code. That's static polymorphism. And it's basically where modern C++ is headed. It's what modern C++ is all about, static polymorphism. Um, unfortunately, well, <laughs> we're not here to talk about modern C++. We will talk about the other type of polymorphism, dynamic polymorphism, and also object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming and polymorphism uh, are very, th th well, the basic definition of object-oriented programming doesn't include polymorphism in itself, but in the past, I don't know, 20 years, I guess, it has come to imply it. Whenever somebody's talking about object-oriented programming, then they're most likely, well, 99.999% are likely also talking about dynamic polymorphism. <coughs> now, the dynamic polymorphism is basically when the compiler, or interpreter for that matter, uh, can see a function call, well, let's say a function call, and um, can't know which piece of code will be executed next. So uh, it's, that means that it's uh, resolved at runtime as opposed to compile time, how it was with static polymorphism. And it, it's also in the category of things which are slower and can't have good compilation errors, which is basically totally against modern C++. And indeed, much of the evolution of modern C++ is oriented towards having better performance and better compilation errors through static polymorphism. So also, object-oriented programming has been criticized a lot, and many times rightfully so. And indeed, classic object-oriented programming, the one you have in Java uh, or C Sharp or vanilla C++ for that matter, uh, typically cannot, in some cases it's just not enough and can lead to, to bad designs which people hate and they transfer their hate for the particular implementation in that language, for example, to object-oriented programming uh, as a whole. So maybe because of this, and maybe because of the fact that modern C++ has been focused in other areas, some C++ programmers have forgotten or <laughs> deliberately chosen to forget that C++ is, among other things, uh, an object-oriented language. So, and yeah, out of the box, vanilla C++ only gives us virtual functions for uh, polymorphism in an object-oriented context. <coughs> but uh, my, I don't know, my proposition is that that's not a problem with object-oriented programming as a whole. In, in fact, object-oriented programming is a great way to handle business logic. It's just that some implementations of object-oriented programming are, well, bad at it. 
uh, business logic we in the game industry we call gameplay. So gameplay logic and business logic are basically the same. <coughs> so uh, some people have gone on to say that uh, C++ is uh, a bad choice for business logic and thus uh, use an approach by, uh, by having uh, another language alongside C++. And indeed, many projects use uh, languages like Lua, Python, JavaScript, or Ruby alongside C++ in order to have their great power of creating business logic via object-oriented programming uh, and uh, have a core in C or C++, which is used to handle the performance-critical parts of the software. Now, this is because C++ has poor OOP capabilities, out of the box again, uh, and those languages have great ones. C++, uh, those languages typically allow you to have easily hot swappable code. And by that I mean you can, while you create your software, while it's running, while it's some state that you want to preserve, you can just add some kind of functionality or change existing functionality and it will be changed as your software is running. That's hot swap. Um, and also those languages with their powerful DSL capabilities allow in many cases to have at least some parts of the code to be delegated to non-programmers like designers or um, like business logic experts or data entry and stuff like this. However, using uh, an additional language alongside C++ has its own drawbacks. Mainly, the code is slower. And yeah, there are JIT compiled languages like JavaScript. Uh, Lua has a JIT, good JIT compiler. But even in these cases, three to four times slower is typically the norm. There are edge cases in which JIT compiled code can be faster than uh, naively compiled C++ indeed, but those are very rare. And uh, on the flip side, there are edge cases in which even JIT compiled code can be tens of times slower than its C++ counterpart if, if it hits a very unfriendly uh, piece of uh, functionality. <coughs> uh, using another language alongside C++, of course, requires you to have a binding layer, which is a significant piece of code which is dedicated only to uh, keeping, managing the connection between C or C++ and other more object-oriented friendly language. And this piece of code, as I said, often of significant size is source of bugs. You need to support it. it the, your binary gets bigger and stuff like this. Um, and also, even with the best of intentions, sometimes smaller utility functionalities are just not practical. Uh, it's, it's, it's never practical to have those utility functionalities in, in one language and expose them through the binding layer, and instead you just duplicate the code. So duplicating the code, it's not strictly duplicating because the code is in different languages, but it does the same thing, and oftentimes is the source of duplicated bugs. So those are some uh, drawbacks of using another language alongside C++. So that's basically about all we have to say about polymorphism. So clearly, a new take on the problem is needed. So indeed, there are some developments. I mentioned the C++, modern C++ isn't uh, focused on dynamic polymorphism. Uh, apart, for example, they, they did add uh, std function and std bind in the C++11 standard, but those aren't part of object-oriented programming per se. So, People, the community has created some libraries which help us deal with polymorphism in modern C++. Uh, polymorphic type erasure wrappers are probably the most popular ones right now and they're being developed and people are going crazy about them. Uh, even though boost type erasure, the, an example I have here of such a library is very old. It's ancient, I think, like I don't know, 10 or more years old. Uh, but uh, libraries which bring the feature to this, well, decade, not but the net, to the next decade, I guess, are uh, Dino, which is an open source library, and uh, Facebook's Folly Poly. Uh, they all are basically the same. This is a piece of code, which is uh, the, the macro over here, library magic, is something that will be different for those three libraries, but the rest of the code can basically be the same. So with this library magic thingy, you can create a type, which is, um, by in this case, uh, this type has, uh, can, can respond to the method uh, draw, which is void and has an uh, ostream uh, parameter. Then you can have such classes like square or circle, which have methods within them which 
have the same signature. Then you can have a function which has this concrete type as an argument. And then you can call this function with a square or a circle. And yeah, this is a great improvement uh, of virtual functions. It's uh, better at information hiding because you don't need to have a predefined interface, uh, a, a type that all, all your classes need to derive from. It's non-intrusive because if you see, uh, then neither square nor circle are derived from drawable. Those are just uh, existing classes. So you can have uh, create interfaces for libraries which never were never intended to be used in this way. So it's more extensible, thus. And uh, in some cases, especially uh, with the efforts of Dino, it can potentially be faster than virtual functions. Now, that, that's not a significant thing, but in any case, they are not slower than pure virtual functions. <coughs> uh, however, in terms of architecture, this is more or less the same. You still ha have your interface types, your implementation types. Uh, it's, it is improved virtual functions, but uh, it's, it, it makes your code cleaner and probably your um, programming a bit easier, but in terms of the whole architecture of the software, they're not much more than Java or C Sharp or vanilla C++. Uh, this doesn't seem compelling enough for us to ditch scripting languages. Other projects in other directions exist too, like for example, signals and slots, which is popular and it has been popular for a long time. Um, it's especially popular in GUI libraries and it brings us, brings us the, the multicast paradigm. Uh, multicast basically means where you have a single call which transfers internally to a lot of other calls. You have a single, single signal, <laughs> well, that's a mouthful. Uh, you have a single signal and um, when you call the signal or raise it or uh, I forgot what the correct verb for the signals was. <laughs> when you do the thingy with it, uh, you basically have multiple functions being called internally, uh, whereas your code has a single call. Uh, it's very easy, uh, it's a very easy way to think of uh, certain uh, aspects of uh, software or business logic. So Boost Signals 2 is an example of library which gives you signals and slots, and there are many, many libraries which exist out there based on Fast Delegate, which is an ancient, uh, standard, incompliant piece of software, but it's very fast. Uh, also, you have multiple dispatch. Uh, multiple dispatch is an obscure feature. Um, to explain multiple dispatch, I should start with singular dispatch. When you have a method of a class, you can think of this as a function where the first argument of this function is the class. And based on what that first argument is, in terms of virtual functions, you will end up calling different functions. For, for example, our square circle example, you put a drawable as, a, as the first argument and you will either call the circle or the square drawing function. Multiple dispatch does the same thing, but for multiple arguments of the function. So you can define, for example, a function for uh, squares and circles, and when you call collide, it will call the, okay, this is the collision checker for squares and circles. Then you, have, you can have a circle, circle collision, square, square collision, circle, square, and whatever other figures you might think of. Um, very few languages support this feature uh, on their own, and it's relatively easy to mimic. It's basically two virtual calls instead of one. Um, however, there are libraries which support it. I mentioned Folly Poly, Facebook's Folly Poly library. It does support it in, in a limited way, but uh, still powerful enough for some people. And there's an open multi-method library, which is very popular, and it has a very rich implementation of multiple dispatch. And of course, there are many functional programming libraries which give us uh, a lot of nice um, features for uh, dynamic polymorphism, but they're not related to object-oriented programming, so I won't spend any time on those. Now, every single piece of, this, of what I said before is basically not enough. Now, there are jabs here and there trying to improve uh, program, object-oriented programming in C++, but I don't know of a single complete solution which uh, encompasses many features and if indeed much more uh, which exists. So, hence the title of my talk, the main part of my talk is dynamics. 
uh, Dynamics is a C++ library. It's open source. It's MIT licensed. So this means that you can basically do whatever you want with it. Use it whatever you like. Change it. I don't care. Uh, it's over here. You can find it easily um, at GitHub. Uh, and this talk here is introducing this library after our introduction. So the talk focuses on the what and why aspects of the library. And by that I mean what it does and what's the reason for it to do so. But uh, implementation details aren't covered at all. Uh, you can find me and ask me later if you're interested. Um, there will also be a small demo uh, in the middle of the talk somewhere. Um, and so let's go on with a bit of history. The library was, and you see 2007. I am not kidding when I say I'm not talking about modern C++. It's fully, comp well, the initial implementation was fully compatible with the C++ 98 standard. Anyway, um, in 2007, uh, me and uh, a friend of mine, actually, we were colleagues back then at a company. We created the initial prototype of this library for a company we used to work for, working on a mobile uh, or a PC uh, massively multiplayer online RPG. Um, after the game sadly failed and we left the company, uh, in 2013, I decided that this library was too good to uh, not have the world uh, use it, so I re-implemented it as Boost Mixin. Boost Mixin was the name then. Um, and I tried to uh, push it to Boost, so I added it to the Boost review board, and there it stood for, I don't know, a year probably, and basically nobody wanted to review it. And as you'll come to find out, it's relatively hard to, to do a proper review of the library. Uh, it's relatively hard to explain, and in 2013, the initial um, spark and uh, the whole glory of creating Boost Library was kind of going down, and people wouldn't just uh, review a library if it couldn't be explained in a couple of sentences. And if anybody's counting my sentences, at, uh, that's probably how it takes a 45-minute talk in order to explain basically what the library does. So uh, there it stood without having anyone review it. So in 2016, I gave up and just for the library and rebranded it as Dynamics. Uh, and it has no boost dependencies right now whatsoever. It just depends on the standard C++ library. Um, some projects have used this or similar library. This is Earthrise, the MMORPG I mentioned, which used the initial proprietary prototype well, that's a mouthful again, uh, of the library. Um, Epic Pirate Story is a mobile game, which is an exploration tactical game. It uses the library and uh, it uses Boost Mixing. It was before the Dynamics era. Uh, then there are Blitz Brigade, Rival Tactics. Uh, they, they're, they use Dynamics and they're a tactical mobile game. And War Planet Online is a Multi, massively multiplayer online strategy, I guess, again for mobile devices. Uh, unfortunately, those are all proprietary software and I don't know of an open source project which uses it. Uh, there are two more mobile games in development that I know of which use the library. So, what is this thing that I'm constantly talking about but refuse to, to say what it is? It's not a physics library. <laughs> even though the name might suggest so. It's not even a game library, even though all the projects that I know of which use it are games. Uh, it's a new take on polymorphism. It's a way to compose and modify polymorphic objects at runtime. Now that may sound strange, but let me go on. So, in fact, let me not go on, but let me uh, show you some Ruby code. This is a complete working Ruby program. Basically, we create uh, flying creature module, which has methods move to, which can move if 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 the target can move if the uh, the object can move to a certain target, it flies to there and otherwise it can fly to there. It also has a can move to method, which is used here, and it just returns true because flying creatures don't care; they just fly where they want. Also, well, let's have a module which is called afraid of events, which basically has the can move to method, but if the target is an even number, it refuses to go there. So, we can create an empty object in Ruby. This is valid code. We can extend it with flying creatures, and then it starts uh, responding to those methods here. 
So it then can, you can call can move to and move to. So we call move to 10, it's flying to the there, no problem. Then we extend the object with the freight of events, and this can move to method overrides this one. So right now we can call move to, and this call over here will in fact call this method over here, and it won't move to 10. This is valid Ruby, you don't have to do anything besides this code to do it. And back in 2007, me and my friend were sitting and looking at very similar piece of code in Ruby. And we were asking ourselves, why can't we have this but in C++? And after some talks and discussions, we found the answer. And it was, there is no reason why. We can have this in C++. So that was basically our goal when we created the library. Uh, those, what I showed you right there, using Ruby modules in such a way uh, is called mixins. So the library's name, I mentioned boost mixin, and dynamics is basically a portmanteau of sorts, which means dynamic mixins. And you may be familiar with the term mixin in current C++, which is a way to, again, to compose objects out of building blocks, but at compile time, usually via CRTP. So those should be called static mixins because they're used for static polymorphism. Dynamic mixins are used for dynamic polymorphism, hence this name. So those are static mixins. Uh, that's basically how you can create uh, different types of music players. You can have the CD reader class, which can get a sound. So I'm using strings for sounds here for simplicity, of course. <coughs> so uh, a CD reader, if, if, if it has a CD, uh, it will play it. Uh, otherwise, it will play silence. Um, you can also have, uh, for example, an MP3 reader. You can imagine the simple code it will have there. So also we have headphones. The, this is a static mixing. It gets the class which derives from it as a template, template argument. So um, after this, it defines the method self in which it casts, it casts itself to the inherited class. And then it can use this self method to refer to the object which is created from this component or this building block. So we can create classes like Discman, which is a CD reader, and headphones. Uh, also, we can have a speakers class. Of course, you can imagine how it will work, too. We can create a boombox, which is a CD reader, and a speaker. It has speakers. We can create an iPod, for example, which is an MP3 reader, and has headphones. And all of those will work. Those are distinct, different types composed of those building blocks. And of course, when we call play for the music, this will be appropriately instantiated and compiled and cast to appropriate type, and it will automatically work. This is how you basically use it. You can create a disk man, you can add some CD to it, you can use the player, and this is the uh, static polymorphic code, the same piece of code which the compiler compiles to different binaries, depending on whether it's this call or this one. Now, dynamics also allows you to have building blocks. And the building blocks of the library are um, the object. The object is just an empty bag of sorts. It's nothing on its own. You use it to add and remove mixings from it. Uh, mixings are classes which are written by the users. The library offers no mixings on its own. Uh, those are the classes which will contain the business logic of your software. And also there are messages. Now, I'll try to explain what messages are in the next couple of slides. Uh, not focusing on them, but with different examples, I guess. But messages are basically function-like pieces of interface that an object might implement. You can safely think of those as methods. Now, message is a term generally in object-oriented programming, but many languages which don't have um, dynamic binding have dropped it and moved to using only methods. Anyway, I'll, I'll go on with that later. Um, uh, to use the library, you can mutate objects, which is the process of adding or removing mixings, or you can call messages, which is the, the way you actually execute the business logic that you've written. Now, the same example with the music players, here it is again, but this time with dynamics. You can create an empty object, it has nothing in the side of it. Then you can mutate it, adding a CD reader and a headphones output. Then you can 
this is a non-polymorphic call. So we just get the CD reader mixing and we call the insert method of it non-polymorphically. But this call here, the message play, is polymorphic. So play will work on this sound player and when we remove the headphones output and add the speakers output, again, play will work uh, on the same object while it's living this time uh, uh, at runtime changing the object. So play is the message uh, which is a polymorphic call. Now unfortunately for me and for Bjarne and for many, many C++ programmers, uh, C++ doesn't have unified call syntax that probably never will. So we cannot have sound player dot play, which would be the much nicer way of calling things in terms of how you read the code. Uh, and because object is part of the library and not written by the user, uh, we cannot have every single possible method within it. So uh, we are resorted to having play, uh, the, the methods or the messages, uh, how we call them, uh, having the object for which they're called as the first argument. So uh, and, and, and <coughs> instead of using sound player dot play, we use player where the first play, where the first argument is the sound player. So, this is, of course, impossible on its own. <laughs> uh, C++ is a powerful language, but not that powerful, unfortunately. So in order to define messages, to, to declare messages first, we need to use those library macros. Basically, a macro, oops, there's an error. Okay, this should be zero. A macro is this one here where the last thing, last number in the macro name is how many arguments the function have, has. Uh, for example, this is the get sound or void uh, messages. And this is an example foo message which has two arguments, float arg1, string arg2. Then in some C++ file, some compilation unit, you need to define those messages like this. Those time, this time the, the number of arguments is not needed, oh, thankfully. Um, and thus you can fully separate the interface from the implementation, much like the example I showed before. Uh, the, if you have an object and you see the message declaration, the message declarations, you can basically call messages for this object. And it will work if the object responds. And that's the key here. This is uh, late binding. So C++ doesn't have late binding, or Java or C Sharp, they don't have late binding on their own. That's why they dropped the message part. Smalltalk has late binding, and Smalltalk basically introduced the separation between message and method. Basically, a message is what you call for an object. A method is the piece of the object that will implement those, this thing you call. For example, in C++, when you call some class dot some method, it will always lead to some piece of code being executed. You cannot instantiate, for example, a pure virtual, uh, a class with pure virtual functions, an abstract class. Um, in C Sharp and Java, it's the same. But in Smalltalk and, for example, Objective-C, you can. You can have objects which cannot, the, the compiler cannot know whether they implement a message or not. And that's why uh, it makes sense in a late binding context to have the separation between message and method. Basically message is what you call and method is what is being called if indeed there is such a thing. And in dynamics, the messages are totally separate from everything. So uh, when you have an object, you it, you can call any message for it and it will compile, but if the object doesn't implement it, if there aren't any mixings inside of the object which implement this message, it will lead to runtime error. Um, again, some boilerplate this time for mixings. You can declare the mixings in some header and that's basically everything you need in order to add them to a given object. In some uh, CPP file, some compilation unit, you can uh, define them, and those pieces of code don't need to be in the same file, of course, but you will need to have the definition of the class, and then use the definition macro to tell the library in a way that the, such a mixin exists. So, for example, the CD reader, the first argument of the macro is the mixin name, and the second argument are the messages it implements. So it tells the library, if you add this mixin to an object, the object will start implementing get sound, uh, the get sound message. That's basically it. Otherwise, calling get sound for an object will probably trigger a runtime error. 
Um, so that's basically what the CD reader um, mixing would look like in the library. So if you remember the static mixings, the CRTP mixings, they used to have the self method. They used to have a way to refer to their owning object. There is such a way in Dynamics 2 uh, that's the DMDs macro. This basically expands to a pointer to the owning object. So if you want to call messages for the object from which you're a part of as a mix-in, you will need to use DMVs. So basically headphones output calls get sound, the message polymorphically for the object from which it, it's part of, and it works the same way as the CRTP static mixing use, used to work. So then this is like self, like the, the, the original example self. And as you may have seen, there is no inheritance. The library is no intrusive. So you can potentially make mixings out of existing classes without ever changing them. Uh, and now it's probably time for a little demo. Uh, can I use this? Hmm. Oops, sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so uh, what I have here is a simple game. It's turn-based, I have those two characters, I move them with my keyboard. Click, 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 they move around. Uh, it's turn-based, so first I move one of the characters, then I move the other. And um, if we look at the code, for example, we can look at the transform mixing. Uh, I don't know if you, if you paid attention, but this class and the one from the example from the slides, they don't have header and source file separated. This class, because it's never used in a way other than polymorphic, it doesn't need to, to be known to the rest of the world. This class is entirely in the CPP file. Then we just have the define mixing macro, which uh, uses this mixing, and this, this is a simple macro again, oops. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm not used to not having F12 work. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so those are the transform messages, which is uh, set position message, get position message, set direction, get direction, and basically transform interface is a macro which defines all of those messages as a single, as a single word. It's, it's not part of the library, you don't have to do anything like this, it's just easier if you have a bunch of messages which you set to a, which, you, which uh, mixing is implemented at the same time to have a macro like this and just add it there. So again, this is a class which is entirely in the CPP file. Then we have this macro which has set, tells the library. There's a mixing called transform and th this is its interface. Uh, here we have the methods which have the exact same signature as the one in the declaration macros. Uh, and that basically works. So again, the, the entire class in, is in the CPP file. Uh, let's see something we can change in this game. For example, this is an RPG, so we should probably see some health bars uh, above our character's heads. So let's do this. We can go to rendering system, uh, and we can see, this is again not library code, this is my personal code for this game. Uh, if the object has a character mixing, okay, oops. Um, if the object doesn't have a character rendering mixing, I just add the character mixing to the, to, the, to the object. Okay, that's cool. Now I have this piece of code here. Uh, if the object implements the HP message, which is get health points, and the object doesn't have a health bar, I add a health bar. And again, I could have used if the object has the character mixing, but I prefer to use if the object implements get HP because not only characters could have health points. Uh, I can have crates or destructible objects, stuff like this, which also have, has health points. And any object which implements the get health points message will receive a health bar. So not, now let's just build this. Oh, sorry. Um. What? Hmm. 
I should have probably exercised the demo more, right? And voila, we have health bars, which is a class that I've written previously. I didn't write it right now, but uh, it's not some magic. But uh, this, this is how easy it was to add health bars to the characters. Now let's add something more. For example, those characters are from different teams. One is the good guy and one is the bad guy. So let's add some kind of a circle beneath them in order to show which characters belong to, belongs to which team. So we could, of course, in rendering system, add another if like this, if the object has characters say, and if the object belongs to team A, add the blue circle, uh, otherwise add a red circle. But if we check actor uh, system right here, uh, we can see that um, if, uh, if it's the, currently the turn of a given character, then the actor, or an actor in the, in the game place uh, lingo, uh, if it's their turn, then um, a selected actor mixing is added to the object. So this is a mixing which basically does nothing other than to point that this object is the currently selected actor. So uh, if, if you had multiple selection, for example, this, this could be added to multiple objects, doesn't matter. But anyway, we have selected actor which is constantly being added and removed from different characters. Uh, and if we go to, say, uh, here, uh, we can see that we have some com code commented out. Those, those are mutation rules. The library has mutation rules. So mutation rules are some things that allow you to basically mutate mutations. For example, I'm now telling the library by uncommenting this code that if somehow a mixing named selected actor appears in an object, it should automatically add selection mark. And the selection mark is the circle that I was talking about. So this is the bundle, bundle selection rules. There are various selection uh, mutation rules which uh, help you uh, basically compose rules of uh, when adding or removing a certain mix in what else can be added or removed with it. So but just by adding this code, I now have I now have selection circles underneath the characters, but they are not underneath the characters. Why is that? So first of all, I should mention how those, the, the rendering here works. Now, if you see rendering system, basically on its update cycle, it loops through all objects and then calls supply rendering parts for every object, which ideally supplies some kind of rendering like parts com of, the, of, the, of its underlying mixings. But supply rendering parts is a message and you probably thought that only a single mixing within an object can implement a message, but the thing is that we have multicast messages. And supply rendering parts is a multicast message. Okay, supply rendering part is a multicast message. And this means that if I have multiple mixings within the same object which implement this message, when I call this message for this object, all the fun methods of those mixings will be called. So, uh, currently, for example, one of my objects can have character, uh, you saw that I added uh, selection mark and also health bar, and all of those calls are being made internally by the library. The thing is that the order of those calls is typically made by uh, alphabetically sorting the names of the mixings. And I added selection mark, with be which begins with S, I have character, which is a C, I have health bar, which is an H, okay, it doesn't work. So, you probably want to change this. So uh, in order to change this, we can uh, just open selection mark over here, and you can see this class is again entirely within a single CP file. And here is the, uh, the messages it implements. It just supply rendering parts. So selection mark just supplies those circles that are drawn uh, over the characters. We want to control the order in which they're executed, so we can add a priority. Uh, the default priority is zero, so if I, and the highest priority gets called first, so if I add a minus one, it will be called, called last, unless somebody has added someone smaller, something smaller than minus one, okay. Let's see now, okay. What? Did I just say that the exact wrong thing? <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, I did. So the smaller the priority is, oh, of course. That's okay. The <laughs> yeah, there's the problem. The, the smaller the priority is, the, the earlier, uh, well, the later something will get, which the earlier something will get executed. So having bigger priorities basically makes them being executed later. So, okay, now it works. I added the big priority and the zeros are executed first because it's ordered uh, like, uh, well, one, two, three, four, five, this order. Okay, so, um, I changed the order in which multicast messages are implemented when we have a uh, selection mark inside of our characters. Now, let's see something else. Uh, as I said, I'm controlling those characters via the keyboard. I could create an AI component, an AI mixing, which could look like this. This is something really stupid. Uh, it basically, if the character can walk left, it walks left, otherwise it tries to walk right, and if it cannot walk left or right, it basically uh, uh, self-harms itself. Uh, very, very adequate AI for this uh, complex game. Uh, but I haven't added this class in the main executable. I added it in a plugin. So this class doesn't actually work when we just start the executable, but we can dynamically add a plugin like this, and it will load, you see, I'm moving the blue character, and it added uh, an AI to the red character. And it walks left, and it can, if it cannot walk left, it walks right. So this is accomplished by having um, the site actor actions message be implemented by the AI mixing. And uh, basically the logic when loading the plugin is get all characters from the red team and add uh, an AI component to them. The site, character, the site actor actions message is a unicast. That means that only a single mix-in within an object can implement it. But if we set the priority, which is bigger, then it will override the existing messages that are within the, the object. So uh, when we add the set character actions to the object, it basically adds the, the it overrides the existing decide character actions, which is check the keyboard and whatever is pressed, do this, and uh, starts executing the AI. And the cool thing about it is that when I remove the the plugin, it will remove the mix-in, and it will restore the previous functionality of the object. So for example, I'm controlling both characters with my keyboard right now, instead of having the eye control them. <laughs> and this will get, this could get even cooler if we do something like this. Sorry, I forgot to do this last time. So um, I just start the game. Um, now I control both characters with my keyboard. Now I can just load the AI plugin. Why don't I do this? Okay, so the AI plugin works now. I can unload it temporarily. Let's do this. Then I can change the code. I can say, currently the characters try to walk left, and if it can't, it walks right. Let's just switch those. Okay, or let's just make them self-harm themselves if they cannot walk right. So, uh, okay, let's try this. Uh, I haven't stopped the game yet, it's still running. So I just build it. I load the plugin. Okay. Uh, I don't have an animation for this, but I'm so, oh, I do. You see, the health is getting reduced. It self harms itself. Okay, and that was basically hot swap. I did it manually because uh, to, to do it, to do it automatically, you need to add some file watch to watch your source files and if they're changed and can rebuild and just reload your plugin. But it's very easy to do hot swap with this library. Uh, it's not much of an effort compared to just uh, hot swapping C++. Uh, so yeah, while the program was running, I just changed the, the AI logic. That's basically it. Um, okay, let's go on. That, that was basically the demo, uh, introducing some new concepts within the library. Um, so what do we have? Uh, what do we have? Uh, when I started, I mentioned scripts and using uh, dynamic languages alongside C++. So uh, what were the cons of using a scripting language? The code is slower. By using dynamics, you will basically use C++. So whatever C++ can give you, you can have in terms of performance. We have this. Uh, there is more, more complexity in the binding layer. Dynamics is C++, so there is no binding layer. We have this. There are potentially duplicated pieces of software, for example, in utility libraries and stuff like this, 
uh, duplicate pieces of code, I mean. Uh, but this is C++. You can just reuse all your li libraries from uh, the same C++ code. So there is no dupli code duplication and no duplicated functionalities. What were the pros of using a scripting language? C++ has poor object-oriented programming, and I'd argue that this gives you much more power over object-oriented programming in C++. So we basically have this. Um, you can hot swap. I showed you an example of how we could hot swap uh, and change mixings in the living project, preserving the rest of the state. So we have this. And the last one was that you can delegate to non-programmers. And unfortunately, this is C++, so you cannot just give non-programmers the opportunity to write your code. Uh, sorry. But you can mix. There are projects out there which, uh, have, uh, uh, which use both dynamics and a scripting language. So they, um, they can even have mixings written in uh, C++ and some mixes written in the scripting language. So you can have an object which is composed of C++ and, for example, Lua parts. Um, perhaps because of all those things, the library has found a niche of sorts in mobile games. Because mobile games are typically much less willing to sacrifice performance for the usability of a scripting language. So they get this kind of, I don't know, middle ground, I guess, by using a library like Dynamics. But I'd argue that uh, any piece of software which has complex polymorphic objects can make use of such a library. Um, if you have subsystems which care about interface rather than data, if they care about data, perhaps anti-component system is something that you should look into. Um, when you have plugins that you want to ship with your code, not only during development, because HotSwap is typically useful during development where you can just debug or uh, add some kind of uh, special code for debugging while your program is running, but you can even create, for example, uh, a software which has plugins which are shipped separately, which are based on dynamics, and you can start your software, then load the plugins you want to. Uh, the user, I mean, starts the software, then loads their plugins. Many CAD systems work, works like, work like this. Uh, so, of course, most CAD systems would probably benefit from using such a library. I have yet to see, in fact, a CAD system that wouldn't. Uh, what I mean here is stuff like AutoCAD, like uh, 3D Studio Max, uh, stuff like this. They have very complex objects. They typically have a lot of plugins. They have many subsystems. For example, uh, AutoCAD has subsystems for, I don't know, window management, uh, pipes management, electrification management, stuff like this. Uh, it is very friendly to such a library. Um, most games, uh, well, not most games, but some games, not all, definitely not all games would uh, benefit from such a library. Games with complex objects, these include RPGs and strategies, but for example, a 3D shooter would probably not be a good idea to add such a library. Um, some enterprise systems, of course, have very complex objects too. And um, when not to use the library, here is a sentence I really like. I sort of uh, hinted towards it at, at the very beginning. Uh, Dynamics is a means to create the project's architecture rather than achieve its purpose. So if you have a purpose for your object, for a project, which is to do this and this, Dynamics will not help you to do this in any way. But it will help you create your architecture in a way that it's comfortable and easy for you to write and develop your project. We're running out of time, aren't we? Uh, so basically small scale projects and projects which have little use of polymorphism and uh, existing LAR projects which have already have their, which have their architecture sort of, I don't know, set in stone, I guess, would probably not find a good use of such a library. Now in performance critical code as any polymorphism, uh, it's not a good use, uh, it's not a good place to, to use such a library. It's not a good place to use virtual functions or std function or anything like this, of course. Now, this is the performance part, which I'm going to basically skip, but I'm going to say that calling messages is basically as fast as calling std function. So it's a bit slower than virtual functions, but not dramatically slower. You won't feel any difference uh, if you use std function. Uh, so that's, uh, we can compose and mutate objects. We can have union multicast messages. We can manage the execution with priorities. We can have hot swappable or even releasable plugins. And there are lots of other features that I just didn't have time to mention. And that's basically it. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for questions?
Yes, yes. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, uh, one, uh, what about uh, compile time errors? No, thank you. We don't have compile time errors. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> if, if you want compile time errors when you call a message for an object which the object doesn't implement, it can never be possible. This is late binding. Any message is potentially applicable to any object. Okay, so, the errors only in runtime. Uh, this kind of errors, but of course, if you call uh, a message with arguments which it doesn't support, for example, you have a message which it, with, with an integer arguments, like you call message play, say the second argument was the time at which the play starts, and it's an integer, say time 332, if you call it with a string, it will be a simple C++ compilation error because strings cannot be cast implicitly to integers. So yeah. these kinds of errors you will have. Those, the, yeah. the message functions are still C++ functions. Yeah, but I uh, mean about errors when I uh, want to... Как это? Наследовать. А по-русски тоже можно, если легче. Да, хорошо. Если я... Окей. Я, меня волнуют ошибки, которые возникают при неправильном использовании как раз полиморфизма, наследования, что я ошибся, когда написал, что я хочу реализовать этот интерфейс, а там нет возможности реализовывать его. Yeah, the question was basically if, if the object doesn't implement an interface and I try to invoke it. Yeah, unfortunately, this will be a runtime error. It will be an exception. You can disable exceptions and have only assertions and in release it will just crash. But typically it will lead to an exception which you can catch. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a runtime error always and can never be changed. Okay, thank you. And second question. Uh, am I right that uh, plugins uh, can be uh, a dynamic library loaded? Yes, they, they, in fact, they, they are dynamic libraries. In this case, this is just a shared object, a dynamic library. In Windows, it would be a DLL. Those are plugins which you compile separately, and then you load inside the library, unload, load again, uh, and that's it's basically It's very cool, it. thank you. Other questions here? Um. Okay, I'll ask you. Uh, asking in English. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's very, very interesting to see how harmless Czech characters harm themselves. <laughs> uh, but sometimes we have to make a sacrifice, right? <coughs> uh, so, uh, considering hot swap, uh, what about thread safety? Uh, hot swapping is hot swapping thread safe. Uh, oh, I, I did have some points about thread safety, but in the interest of time, I skipped them. So I'm just going to go back. Uh, okay, here. So basically, calling messages is safe. Uh, you can call uh, messages for objects, and they are as thread safe as the underlying methods in the mixings they, they, they actually implement. But um, mutating an object in one thread and calling messages on it in, on, in another thread is not safe. So if you want to call messages for an object and then mutate it in a plugin or whatever, this is not safe. I mean, uh, I guess it's an error, so you Mutating different objects in multiple threads is safe. So if you, for example, have uh, your main loop running in a, in a thread, and uh, somehow you guarantee that uh, loading a mixing uh, plugin in another thread won't mutate the objects which are currently uh, touched by the main loop uh, for which messages are called. So you won't have the situation where mutating an object is happening in one thread and messages are being called on the same object in another mm -hmm. thread. If you don't have this situation somehow, then it's, thre it's totally thread safe. Mm -hmm. You can mutate many objects in many different threads. You can load tens of plugins at the same time, and if they mutate objects, uh, even the same objects, oh, two, two different objects, if they mutate different objects, it will work, mm -hmm. but yeah. <coughs> you can, uh, but it's not part of the library, but you can easily have it yourself. You can easily write it yourself. It's not part of the library because it will, it will be needlessly slow to make it a part of the library, but there are many ways to, to make it safe by adding your own syn synchronizations. Okay, uh, the last question <laughs> for uh, me. I no time, I'm sorry. I, I'm getting uh, pulled out here. Uh, you can ask me uh, privately. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for talking.